your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. everybody and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Tonight we're going to talk with author Jake Richards about his book Backwoods Witchcraft, Conjure and Folk Medicine from Appalachia. Now Jack's family heritage goes back for generations and he's practiced Appalachian folk magic for almost a decade and teaches classes on the subject in Jonesboro, Tennessee where he owns Little Cot. I, I don't know matter with me. Little Chicago Conjure, which is a supplier of Appalachian folk magic and ingredients. He holds his Appalachian heritage close to his blood and his bones. Now, as always, we welcome questions and comments from the chat room. And if you're not here, you can join us at paraxradionetwork.com. All right, so now we've got a ton of things to cover in a quick hour. So, Jake, welcome, o- well, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, I had to. I mean, the book is good. <laughs> I saw the title and I had to have it. And then, you know, it was just one of those natural things. I called the called the uh, publisher and said, come on, we got to have him on the show. So we're doing that. That's good. All right. So as I mentioned um, before in your bio, you've been practicing and teaching classes on the subject for, you know, about 10 years or so. Now, although the magic in my family came down to me from my great-grandmother, um, but since she was long gone and nobody in the household was magically inclined, I kind of played around with, with the craft um, when I was a kid. But it wasn't until I was an adult that I really took it seriously. Now, because you grew up in an environment where magic was a part of everyday life, um, I mean, you were impressed by seeing things like your grandfather, who was a Baptist minister, could rid somebody of a fever with an egg or, or stop the blood in a, in a wound um, were you doing that or were you just kind of doing kids stuff and just figuring that that's just normal stuff that everybody does I honestly just thought it was normal until uh, I guess in like middle school or high school I would go to you know some friends houses who you know they weren't really country or anything like that and they did things totally differently and then I would you know mention something like that and they would give me these weird looks and I was like oh, okay so maybe this isn't normal <laughs> so did you try I mean were you dabbling in it um, I mean as your part of your lifestyle too because that's kind of what it was well I mean I wouldn't say I, it was like dabbling it was almost just like second nature yeah, um, okay. so like uh, some things in the house you know kids just weren't supposed to touch um, or, you know anything like that Mm-hmm. and you behaved this is good <laughs> they probably <laughs> Put the fear of God in those aspects, you. yeah. <laughs> Touch it or die kind of thing, yeah. Um, all right, so Appalachian magic is folk magic, and folk magic is generally passed down from generation to generation. How far back can you trace the tradition in your family? Uh, well, that depends on the line that you look at. On my mother's side, I can trace it back to my uh, my. Hold on, let me count. My great great grandfather Oscar, <laughs> he was a what they called back then a water witch. So he would basically go around and tell people which for water on their land to dig a well, and he mm-hmm. could tell you know how how deep the water was, 
Um, and even sometimes, like, uh, what do you call them? Uh, like, I guess what kind of what kind of spring or well it was, like if it was going to be limestone or anything like that in the water. Mm, um, mm-hmm. And then on my father's side, I can trace it back to, at least to my great-grandmother who lived in uh, North Carolina on uh, Big Ridge. Mm-hmm. Um, you knew your grandparents, right? But not probably great granny or great grandpa. Uh, well, I I knew my great grandparents on uh, my father's side, mm. uh, but the ones on my mother's side had already passed before I was born. Okay, because you know I know that ancestor worship is a big part of your practice, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. You know, we're we're. I was reading about your shrine to the ancestors and uh, when I was reading that it's taboo in ancestor veneration about keeping pictures of the living on the shrine I really started cracking up because on my ancestor altar I wanted to use a particular picture of my grandfather but Mm -hmm. I didn't because he was holding me as a baby and it freaked me out I mean I didn't know it was taboo but I just felt like uh, (laughs) I don't think anything living should be on that that shrine and, and uh, particularly me so <laughs> let's, let's talk about shrines for a minute um i'm you know it's kind of like with mine i just have their pictures i have something that belonged to them basically um and it's in a bookcase just like yours is <laughs> so mm-hmm. if somebody wanted to to do a shrine um what would you suggest what would they put on it or or you know do you do it a little bit differently? I mean, everybody has their own way. Honestly, the simplest form is, you know, of course, gather like the photos and memorabilia of, you know, the the dead. And, you know, just create a shrine for them with like a, I use a, a what do you call it? Like a, like a lace tablecloth runner or something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. I forget the actual mm-hmm. name for it. Yeah. Uh, just that, a couple of glasses of water, maybe a Bible, and some candles, of course. And then that's, you know, the simplest thing. Then over time, you can, you know, add offerings of pennies, hard candy. Um, I also add, like, those little uh, those little shot bottles of alcohol, um, all sorts of different things, really. <laughs> I put up my, shot, my grandfather's shot glass. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's whatever you, whatever you feel like, I think, you know. It's important. I mean, there's no right or wrong way, but I really believe it's important to have an ancestor altar. And it doesn't have to be flamboyant. It doesn't have to be in the middle of the room. It can be, you know, just somewhere where we can go and know that they're there, right? Yeah. We I always keep mine in the living room because that's like where like the like the family gathers. So mm-hmm. that way the ancestors also, you know, with the family in the living room as they were in live. That's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think it's real important to never forget them because I think they don't ever forget us and they're around when we need them. So I think it's only fair to venerate them in, in any way we yeah. can. Yeah. And you can you can learn a lot, a lot about even yourself from, uh, like, not, not just, you know, learning about your ancestors, but about them from living family members. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I know in my family, uh, there's a lot of little, I don't know what you would call it, like little unconscious behaviors or something, Traits. like the you know, something like that. Um, uh, like my mother, she, uh, she she's just like my my nana who recently passed back in January of two uh, thousand twenty. Mm-hmm. Uh, when she goes to well, when she's asleep, she sometimes rubs her feet together just like Nana used to. Mm-hmm. And then I've been told that uh, not only do I look like my my memo Sadie, my great grandmother on. Uh, my mom aside, uh, but I also do this weird thing with my mouth when I'm concentrating on something or, I don't know, something like that. So mm-hmm. in one way or another, the ancestors, you know, they do actually live through us, even if it's, you know, mostly unconscious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we we can't ever forget. And just, you know, every so often say hello, you know. You don't have to have an altar to acknowledge them. So anyway, all right. Exactly. 
<laughs> All right. So while some people um, believe that magic is complicated and requires a closet full of bottles and jars and implements, um, Appalachian witchcraft is very much nature-based. And rather than uh, having to find an occult shop to get supplies, tools, and materials, um, all that stuff is available from the land. And that's a very lovely simplicity, isn't it? It is, but it's a lot. It's a lot more work, especially when you have to, uh, you know, go out and learn, you know, where certain uh, roots or plants grow, what their habits are, what time of year they're going to be out. Um, so it's a, it's a lot more complicated than you know just running down to the store to get some herbs. It is, but you know, when you, I don't know, I, I kind of have this thing about buying things um, because how many people have handled them you know Mm -hmm. they're not always maybe what they seem like there was this big deal about hematite um, the stone and one of the things was that people are selling them like on Amazon you know packages of, of hematite but they're not really hematite because they're selling bracelets that they call hematite that that are magnetic you know they stick to each other well pure hematite doesn't do that um, or, you know, they get really good representations like something that's plastic or, or a different kind of material that really feels like a stone. So you really don't know. I mean, the average person really doesn't know what they're getting if it's totally authentic. Or, you know, exactly. maybe maybe somebody who's selling it has a, a anger at people and he kind of you know, like curses them or something. You know, here, take this and watch what happens. Ha, ha, ha. Right? So. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I think it, it, to get things from nature, from the land, is, is yes, maybe it's harder to cultivate them. But it just, at the same time, it seems more uh, tangible, more simplistic, and, and kind of really much nicer. Yeah. Mm. All right. And, and the other thing, too, is that Appalachian witchcraft is not a cookie-cutter craft. I mean, oh, you're... No. Your approach in this book is teaching the roots and charms from your family because each family, each region has its own way of doing things. And um, But you also say that there is a common denominator in folk magic, and that's God and the Bible. And I want to talk about that because um, that's a very integral part of your practice, right? Yes. Yeah. So talk about the religious aspects and stuff, because I know, <laughs> I know you were talking about um, um, your grandmother or something would would uh, talk about the Psalms or read the Psalms as she was mm-hmm. cooking because it was things in the Bible that had to do with food or or whatever her other her, her workings were. There was always a Psalm to uh, be attached to it. So it's, yeah, the, the yeah. Uh huh. No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, the same kind of flavor of Christianity that developed in Appalachia uh, basically developed due to, uh, you know, all the, the poverty and as well as the isolation that occurred here. Um, so people kind of developed this independent spirit um, and independent personality uh, that, you know, permeates our culture as well as, you know, our religious beliefs. Um, so there was never a concept of needing a middleman between this world and the other. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so instead of being out there or up there, God was in the home and present always. Um, and because a lot of people, you know, back in those days, they didn't, uh, they didn't have the ability to read or, or write like, you know, the majority of people do today. So they kind of, that kind of blended itself to the, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, so I guess I, I guess the, the the emphasized belief in the power of the Bible itself, because in, in that it was a written word, but not only just a written word, but also the written word of God, of, you know, of the Creator. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so that lends itself to further to uh, the fact that words have power. So then, you know, folks would integrate you know, Psalms or Proverbs or, you know, really any Bible verse that, you know, that they could relate to in their life, they would integrate that into their daily lives, into their daily tasks and routines. And the and Bible that, is also know, used in... Itself. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. The Bible is also used in spell work, right? I mean, sometimes you you know in in the the spell you or the workings. Um, I don't know if you use if you call it spells or or you know whatever, but um, you know it, it's you'll open to a specific psalm, you know, a specific place in the Bible, and that's working for what the works are doing, right? Yes, and that's one of the one of the places where. Uh, folk magic and folk medicine overlap in Appalachia because uh, sometimes it, it may it may seem like you know just a little simple um, like remedy or old old wives tale but it is actually you know much more than superstition uh, like some folks uh, depending on the like disease or ailment that they're trying to treat they would you know write out a Bible verse and then basically soak it in either a cup of water or they would bake it into a loaf of bread. And then they would feed that to the ailing person. Uh, in, in the again, in the belief that words hold power, mm. um, to you know, for those words to uh, affect some sort of cure. Words do hold a lot of power, and people don't realize that. And you know, sometimes even energy. You know, we put out energy about things, and it goes out whether we want it to or not. You know, I mean, we have to be careful of what we say and what we do and what we feel sometimes, because the universe listens and and things get carried into it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so in the book, um, in addition to like family stories. It includes lore, it includes omens, it includes rituals, conjure crafts that you learned from your great grandmother and grandfather and, and folk rep folk recipes and, and mm-hmm. remedies. Um, one of the stories in the book um, and, and its superstition is the tale regarding the devil's looking glass. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a banshee. And there, and you know, now per- people are going to say, "Well, what does a banshee have to do with Appalachia?" You know, because you think of that as Ireland, right? Um, so let, let's talk about the banshee and the belief system, and then tell the tale because you really heard her. Yeah, uh, a lot of the like folklore and superstitions and stuff of Appalachia, uh, the majority of it all comes from like the British Isles, from like uh, Ireland, Scotland, and uh, Britain. Um, and with that comes over, uh, I guess you would call it a cryptid. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but in, I know in Ireland, what, you know, way back when, before America was colonized, uh, the Banshee was traditionally like a, a... A grim reaper coming to take you away or something, right? Something like that. They would, but Banshees were only to... Uh, basically alert certain families uh, of, of death, and it was only a certain number of families. And then after uh, the creation of America, and then the the those bloodlines being diluted, um, the folklore kind of changed to Banshees just uh, alerting people to death in general, because, you know, the Irish blood was, you know, diluted into everybody, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and one of the you know, tall tale signs of a banshee was uh, their scream, that it was, you know, like a woman screaming. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was, uh, God, how old was I? That's when she lived on Mint Hill, so I must have been like eight, nine years old, something like that. Uh, I was playing in the woods, and uh, it's hard to describe. It's like the woods went down into like a ravine or something like that, mm-hmm. uh, like a crevice. And uh, me and some friends were just playing and we just heard this woman scream out of nowhere and we had no idea what it was. So, you know, we went, we, uh, we ran back to Nana's house and, uh, she said it was either a, a banshee or a black panther. And that, that's when she told me about the black panther, uh, and explained that that's why I don't want you in those woods, you know, you know, after the street lights come on, cause you know, they can hide up in trees and they'll, you know, jump down and pounce on you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a little yeah. while after that, that uh, I believe that 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 was right before my papa passed away from his seventh heart attack. Wow. Yeah, I, I wonder if you've never heard anything like that since, right? I don't think so. 
I don't I know, mean, there's so many memories to keep up with. <laughs> I know. I mean, <laughs> so much to keep up with. So much. Well, you know, you have a really big family too. So you know, it goes back to the different generations and the aunts and the uncles and everybody that you know. So many experiences that are going on. And I spent and, my childhood, you know, all over. Whether you know, uh, in East Tennessee, Western North Carolina. So it's hard to figure out where I was when what when whatever happened. <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, and and you're making new because I was uh, always in the woods, regardless. <laughs> well, see, yes, yeah, see, very nature based and everything. That's really important. Um, I mean, we try to do that too. It's like you know, well, we we go to nature to heal in in that sense, you know, because that's that's we don't need psychiatrists. We just need nature, and it works really <laughs> well. It helps a lot, but. Um, when did you decide to start practicing then um, the craft and and teaching? Um, it was it was after it was a, a, about a year or so after Pabal passed. So that must have been let's see here. A lot's happened in the past ten years, so it's hard to sift through. Mm. I must have been like ten, eleven, twelve something in that age range uh, when I started looking into it more because I remembered that, you know, Nana had, you know, said something about uh, Pebble being able to, you know, stop the flow of blood with the Bible verse. And that piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. um, and then here we are now. So who did you run to for for teaching you? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot going on, but once you get serious about something, you really want to dig into it. So so who were your mentors at that time? Uh, well, mostly my mother and my grandmother. Um, but it wasn't teaching as like, um, you know, sitting down and just telling you everything. No. It was, you know, small little lessons, uh, you know, over a lifespan, basically. Um mm -hmm. And that's why it's so important to, you know, listen to your elders when, you know, they tell you something. Because when, you know, speaking with older people, uh, the first time they tell you is going to be going to be the, you know, the freshest information for them. But if you, you know, ask them to repeat it, um, you know, some bits of information may be lost if you weren't listening the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and even then they wouldn't, uh, you know, give all the information in, you know, just one sitting. You would have to piece it together yourself uh you know, again, over over a course of a lifetime, basically. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see it and you hear it. See, my, my experience was so different because nobody wanted to tell me anything. Um, they didn't want me to get involved with the craft because it was, you know, the great-grandmother, and she wanted to pass it down to her daughter. Her daughter didn't want to have anything to do with it. And strangely enough, I'm named after her daughter. So, I mean, it skipped all the generations. In my house, people believed in the afterlife and ghosts and all that good stuff. You know, that was the paranormal and the supernatural was there. But the witchcraft part, they didn't want me to know. But, you know, little kids have big ears. And when they used to talk about it after I was supposed to be in bed, um, mm -hmm. I heard, you know, the stories about great-grandma Sophie. So, I mean, I always kind of knew it was there. I didn't realize that it had come down to me that soon. But I didn't, honestly, I didn't have a book of shadows, for example, of hers. Because A, she was long gone before I was born. And B, it would have been written in Russian anyway. And I wouldn't have understood it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I'm, so you were lucky enough to be in the atmosphere of it all the time. And, yeah, um, so it wasn't like like, like the the things that I had to teach myself mostly were um, I had to train you know, train my eyes to you know see it and recognize it like hey uh, you know not everybody does this this is something unique um, but then I also had to basically wrap my brain around uh, like how it works why it works what's the what, what exactly is the belief behind it um, what patterns you know, am I seeing from my family to this family to this, these stories, you know, basically across the board of Appalachia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, you pick up on things and, so, you know, and like with any magical practice, there are certain parts of it that you gravitate more to. You know, some people uh, gravitate more to divination. Some people gravitate more to scrying. Some people, you know, use the pendulum, whatever. Um, was there anything in particular, one particular 
thing that really got your interest more than anybody else's? Anything else's? Um, probably reading playing cards because I, I learned from my mother uh, when I was, again, like 10, 11, something some around that age. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, just reading actual playing cards is fascinating because I had already tried, like, tarot cards, but I just couldn't really get the hang of it. There were so many, you know, images and meanings that all got so confusing. Yeah, see, I've always been curious about that, you know, because uh, I've... I done tarot and I've got an oracle deck and stuff but I was reading about you know the earliest card reading method was by playing cards and mm -hmm. it's it's a lot probably a little bit easier because there's only 52 playing cards but there's like 78 <laughs> tarot cards that you have to learn but yeah are, that too so many cards yeah but are the spreads kind of the same thing with, between tarot and playing cards or when you're doing um a reading with playing cards, do you do a spread? Do you just pick cards at random, one card, or ask a question and have the card answer? How does that work? Well, the, the way my mother told me uh, is something that I, I've never seen anybody else do. Um, it's essentially, and I, I think I'll talk about it backwards. Let me see. Because I also talk about it in the second book. Well, it's been a while since I've read my first book. <laughs> I, I know that I, you know sometimes I don't remember what's in mine either I don't know which part is in what section yeah oh, there's it's, a contents page do you do it often do you do you um, regularly use the cards for for um, readings and things yeah but I mostly use it for like uh, like big important decisions like whether it's financial decisions you know, moving somewhere or traveling, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Or whether it's just, you know, somebody in a friend group acting shady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when you get out the doll babies. Um, but we'll talk about that after the break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I get that method in this book, or I may have just saved it for the second one. Yeah, I don't think I... I'm I don't think I one, saw it. That, I guess I think that's what I'm asking. But yeah, I mean, I just I find it fascinating because everybody has everybody has a deck of playing cards. I would say just about everybody in their house, and and it would be interesting to learn how to read them. Um, yeah, I, you know. I give that uh, give the method that she taught me. Um, shuffle the deck three times and knock on the top three times. Part the cards into two stacks and hold them to your mouth and breathe on them. Then shuffle the deck again, starting from the top of the deck, flip each and every card over so it's face up, and then basically uh, as you go down the, the row, whenever you get a card that's uh, like a pair, like uh, four of spades and four of diamonds, then you set those aside and you keep doing that, putting the pairs in order, and then after you've gone through, I, I do a total of three runs, so... Uh, after I, you know, lay out all the cards, if I run out of pairs, then I take up all the cards again, you know, leaving the pairs out, of course, mm -hmm. um, and then I reshuffle, and then I do a run again, and I do that for, like, a total of three times, because I feel like doing it just one time doesn't give me, uh, like, all the information that I need, uh, you know, for a situation, because I like to, like, uh, I think of it as, like, building up a story, so, like, I need a, you know, a build-up, a climax, and all that. Um, what, what's the significance of the pairs? Uh, Why well, the, the pairs by themselves can, you know, have one set meaning, but I go further and read each individual card in the pair. Um, so, for example, if you get a, a pair of fours, uh, fours are basically... Uh, representation of the crossroads, whether coming or going or staying in, you know, one place. Mm -hmm. um, if they're both the same color, then you're basically generally staying in, in the same place, whether physically or metaphorically regarding a situation. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the pair is of two different colors, whether black and red, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, spades or diamonds or hearts, mm -hmm. uh, then that shows a different place or that you're going to walk on strange grounds. You're going to be in a situation you've never been put in before, you know, something along those lines. And then I look at the individual card meanings to see exactly how, uh, that overall meaning is going to play out. Um, mm -hmm. and then, 
like if I get two queens, that generally represents a lover. Um, so again, if the if the if the two suits of the two queens are the same color, then it's the same lover. If the queens are different colors, then it's a different lover. And then I read further into the like individual meanings for each particular queen. You know, that's really fascinating. And I'm going to pick it up after the break, but we got to take a quick one now. And okay. that first half half part of the show went by really fast. So um, we'll be back in two minutes, and all you guys stay put. Okay. Stir the cauldron. We'll be right back. So don't go away. If you end up with webbed feet, remember, you've been warned. Missed an episode of Stirring the Cauldron? then be sure to check out MarlaBrooks.com and check out the archive. And while you're there, check out Marla's weekly Witches Oracle card reading. Explore the site to find many great resources, such as information on tarot, oracle readings, metaphysical consultations, and links to all of Marla's books. That's MarlaBrooks.com. Rat! Rat! Where are you going? I'm going back to the paranormal view. Back where I belong. Please, please, take me with you. No, I'm through with everything here. I want to see if there's something left in life I haven't explored. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, Rhett, Rhett, don't run to them. They talk about ghosts and hauntings, UFOs and all kind of supernatural scary stuff. You'll never understand, will you, Scarlet? No! Well, that's your misfortune. Rhett, Rhett, Rhett! Rhett, if you go, where shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear. Line. Oh, you've you got to be line. kidding. That's the Paranormal View with your host, Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, and Barbara Duncan. Every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on the Para-X Radio Network. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Okay, obviously we're back, and um, my guest tonight is Jake Richards, and he's the author of Backwoods Witchcraft. And um, right before the break, we were still talking about playing cards and stuff. I don't think I've ever seen a booklet or a book about doing that. Are there books out there for, for like, you know, learning and reading the cards and stuff? Yeah, there, there's a number of uh I think there's like I know of like three, like I, I don't know their you know their, their full titles or whatever, but like I can still see their book covers in my face in my uh, mind. Uh-huh. Uh, but I know of at least three that uh, you know basically teach you how you know that aren't Lenormand Lenormand I think that's what it's called the Oracle uh-huh. reading or anything like that. Right. Uh, that basically explain how to uh, read the playing cards, but based on you know each person the. The individual card meanings can differ, mm-hmm. as All well right. as you know, like the technique or the method. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've got a deck coming out sometime in the next couple of months. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, uh, conjure cards. Um, it's basically a deck that I started designing when I first began writing back with witchcraft. Uh, because even though I had been reading playing cards for years, even I still had to. Uh, you know, uh, refer back to the notes that my uh, mother gave me when she first taught me. <laughs> um, and, you know, I wanted to figure out, you know, there's got to be an easier way to this where, you know, it can help me, you know, memorize it better without having to basically ever look at the booklet again. Um, mm-hmm. So I basically decided to create a deck where I basically paired uh, images based on whether superstitions, folklore, or dream symbols to particular card meanings. So, like, the Ace of Spades in uh, my card deck is uh, symbolized by an empty baby cradle because the old saying goes that if you you rock an empty baby cradle or an empty empty rocking chair in general, uh, that it invites death into the home. And that Mm -hmm. also pairs with with an old dream superstition that if you dream of a birth, then it's a sign of the death. Hmm. So I basically do that throughout all throughout the whole deck. What what's it called? So people can 
kind of look for it? Right, when it's, it comes out? it's called Conjure Card. That's easy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty not easy. Hard, not hard to forget. I mean, to remember. All right. Um, so, how important is connecting to the land? Um, well, it's it's hard to explain because you know people who have lived here for so long. Um, but most, you know, most for for those of us who don't have the privilege of you know, living in these big cities like Asheville or, you know, anything like that. Um, it, it, it's kind of second nature in that the, the land is, uh, you know, a, sort of like our, um, it, it, it's a big part of our livelihood. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I still know a lot of, uh, you know, like older folks who still go out and uh, they're root diggers. So, like, they basically go out <laughs> on the, you know, on on the on the you know somebody's property up in the ridges or whatever, with their permission, of course. Mm-hmm. And like they'll dig up like ginseng, blood roots. They'll even collect moss off of logs and stuff, and basically take it out and sell it. Uh, you know, for a little extra money until their you know their next check comes in at the end of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, throughout our our entire history, um, we've always been connected connected to the land. Um, but for somebody who, you know, like if they're, you know, their great grandparents or their grandparents, you know, move from Appalachia to, you know, somewhere else, um, then I would suggest uh, in order to connect with the land, first and foremost, you know, come here um, and learn about, like, you know, uh, the different herbs that grow here, the different types of animals, um, the the different seasons, because we have at least at least fifteen winters. Um, <laughs> And, you know, basically get to know it and connect with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we talk about, in, in my practice, about grounding, you know. I mean, you know, it's important to ground yourself to the earth. Get get down and take your shoes off and walk in the walk in the dirt, walk on the grass, you know. Draw it up into you. It's, it's really important. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that. And then there's a lot of people that live in the city. You know, and there isn't really ground. I mean, you live in an apartment building. There may not be any kind of grass or anything around. And, you know, the park could be... Yeah, everything's covered in a layer of rock. Yeah. And, and, you know, the park could be 10 blocks away and you just don't want to do that. But that's why I think people that don't have the option of of getting out into a forest or or at least a, a park or something... Mm-hmm. Have plants in the house, you know, grow something in the house, you know, bring it to life. Get, I just, I don't know how, yeah. there are a lot of people that don't, and I don't get it, but that's just me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually one way that I connect with my ancestors is that I still have a plant. I have no idea what it is. It's some kind of decorative vine type of plant um, from my great-grandmother's funeral. She passed away in... God, how when did she pass away? I think it was like 2003, 2004, 2005, something around that time. Uh, so it's a pretty old plant. I'm, I've still got it growing. Wow. See, that's that's so neat. Yeah. I mean, I, we had a neighbor one time that, that had a hibiscus tree, a yellow hibiscus, really pretty. And he was an old man. I was a kid. And um, when he passed away... My mother snuck over to the next door, because that's where we lived, um, and took a cutting from the tree and she kept it until she died you know she kept that yellow hibiscus growing and we called it mr peterson which was the guy that you know had the tree (laughs) so yeah i think that i think that's really neat and very important um there's a quick 2003 so yeah almost almost 20 years old Mm. yeah and and i hope it keeps going you know I really do. Yeah. Um, there's I really a question. Need to in, it. <laughs> well, yeah, we all do that. You know, the poor little things are struggling in a small pot, and you go, "Yeah, I'm going to do." I've got a bunch of tea roses that need I've to be potted. I've been saying that for years. Uh huh. Yeah, I know. My tea roses hate me because they know they need more space. Um, I got a question from the chat from before the thing, and I just saw it now. Um, Cat wanted to know um, if I think that. Um, being a witch is genetic somehow. And Kat, what I've always been taught is things like that run in your bloodline. And I don't know, um, Jake, if it's the same with you guys, but I've always been told that, you know, things are passed down 
um, generation to generation, and lots of times it's through the bloodline. So do you have that in your practice too? Uh, Something similar, but there was never any kind of uh, cohesive format for it. So uh, like some gifts like the site or, you know, anything like that, uh, is like half of the time it's said to be passed on, you know, like, like through the generation, uh, other times it's simply an occurrence that, you know, happens at birth, uh, usually, uh, you know, during some kind of, uh, childbirth that can, you know, endanger both the mother and the child or that, you know, it used to over a hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah. I, I um, uh-huh. no, I just, uh, you know, people, you don't have to have it in your bloodline to do to practice any kind of, of yeah, magic no. or whatever, but I, it just seems that it's just you, a big help. <laughs> yeah, well, you know that they're there. You know that it's yeah. You know, your blood did the same thing a hundred years ago, and and somehow it just kind of makes it uh, not safer, but it feels better. Maybe that's it. You're yeah, doing just like what anybody the ancestors- can, you know, create art. But then there's those people who who have like a like a natural uh, knack for you know drawing or painting or you know anything like that. They just have a certain eye for it. Um, mm-hmm. But you know it's sometimes you know said about that regarding the site. But then when I was I still have no idea what this means. Um, I was like five or six years old. Uh, my daddy had put a minnow trap in a creek on my grandmother's land down in Greenville, Tennessee. And we went down to check it one day, and there was a copperhead stuck in it. Ooh. And the copperhead got out before he could, you know, basically get it and kill it. And I just walked over and picked it up and started playing with it, and never tried to bite me. And ever since then, they always said I had snake charmer's blood. There you I go. I guess, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you tried it again? That's the $65,000 uh, question. Well, have you tried it again? <laughs> well, or would you uh, try it again? Time, uh, not, you know, voluntarily, no. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the last times that I had, you know, any kind of encounter with the snake was, I, it, it was before COVID hit. So I think the summer of 2019, mm-hmm. um, we had gone hiking to, it, it's like a two, three hour hike uh, to Laurel Falls in Hampton, Tennessee. And it's a two hour hike to the waterfall and then a two hour hike back to you know like the road um and while you know hiking uh i saw you know off the off the path like two or three feet there was something yellow in the leaves and i was like what is that so i looked closer and it turned out to be a what do you call them it's like a a timber rattler snake i think Mm. um and it it i mean it turned its head towards us but it never you know shook its rattle or you know anything like that but i was definitely you know, just about within striking distance had I not seen it. Wow. Yeah. And with them, if you don't see it, they see you first and they'll mm-hmm. get you for sure. <laughs> That's not yeah. good. Um, you know, I loved the chapter called When the Rooster Crows, um, which is mm-hmm. all about candle magic, uh, doll babies, and other trickery. And I really like that, other trickery. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a comprehensive chapter of information on working with the elements, like um, types of dirt, like graveyard dirt or crossroads dirt, um, minerals, herbs, curios, like coins, feathers, and doll babies. And so I want to talk a little bit about doll babies because um, people think they're going to make a doll baby or they call it a voodoo doll or a poppet to harm someone. But often they don't realize that it can boomerang and come back and harm the creator. And the good example in your book was the woman who made a doll out of the dirty underwear and hair of the man that she loved at that time, and mm-hmm. and she wanted him to love her forever. Now, 25 years later, he, he was still obsessed with her, coming to her house, um, disobeying a, a restraining order. I mean, Jesus, lots of people... Um, you know, just don't realize that there is potential negative consequences when you do that. So when you're talking to your students, when you're teaching and you talk about doll babies, um, what kind of really strong information comes out of you first? Uh, Keep it until you know that you're done with it because she buried it immediately and then didn't know that, you know, 25 years into the future, she would she would possibly have to, you know, dig it back up and burn it or, you know, take it apart to, 
you know, uh, have him not be a, still, you know, still be obsessed with her, even though he had a girlfriend. I think he also had kids. I can't remember. Um, so yeah, never, if you create a doll baby and you baptize it in someone's name, don't get rid of it until you are absolutely sure that you're not going to need it again, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, like even if that, if, even if that's just, you know, dedicating a dresser drawer to, you know, just doll babies, <laughs> and no matter how weird that's going to look. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is where I keep my people. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll always keep it until you are absolutely certain that either, you know, whatever situation it is that you're working on has blown over or that the work has been effective enough to where you don't need to, basically you don't need to have any more hands on the situation at all to where you can get rid of the doll or at the very least take it apart before you bury it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least one little piece is with you. So if you're, you're doing things like um, – doll babies um what is it else uh, is it similar is it stronger to like candle magic or you know if if people start wanting to do something you know to to cast mm-hmm. a spell or to, to whatever do you kind of start them at the lower end like candle magic for example and then work oh, up to up to doll babies and i don't know what yeah. you know could be worse than a doll because- baby Definitely, because doll babies are not only – they're not only complex, but they can also be dangerous. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, if you, you know, create a doll baby and it has, a, you know, like a lock of somebody's hair in it, and uh, I'll talk about this in the second book, too, uh, in the chapter Catching Spirits, uh, because that's why there's there's always a, some, some form of connection needed when you're, you know, working on or against somebody for, you know, whatever the reason. Um, you're calling a piece of their spirit into the work whether that's through a footprint, a lock of hair, fingernail clipping, saliva, any kind of other body, bodily fluids, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, you're basically trapping a piece of their spirit into that working, you know, into that uh, conjure bag, you know, into that lamp or candle, and especially into that doll baby. And that's why I think doll babies are uh, a lot more stronger because they, they're, they're not, not only complex, but they demand a lot, a lot more attention. Uh, you have to name it, you have to feed it, you have to basically treat it like that person. Um, and not only that, but it's also in the in, usually in the shape of a human being. So when you call their spirit into it, you know, whether through a lock of hair or, you know, even a name paper, um, it kind of feels more at home there. So it's a lot more um, less confined than it would be in like a conjure bag or uh, a lamp. Um, is able to, you know, fully embody the doll baby itself. Um, I think I talked about in Backwoods, uh, the one experience I had when I forgot to, you know, properly name a doll baby, Mm. um, even though, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, personal concerns or anything like that were, you know, was already in the doll. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd forgotten to name this one doll and, Basically, it it decided to create a an identity of its own because it was in you know what it thought was a human body, a human shaped doll. Um, and I woke up one night in you know middle of the night, like twelve, three o'clock in the morning, something like that. Uh, and the doll was standing up on its own on my dresser. Mm. And I, at first, I thought it, I thought it was just a dream, so I went back to sleep. And the next morning. Uh, the doll was, you know, still in the dresser, and that's when I remember the dream. So that's when I decided to, you know, go ahead and destroy it. So that was definitely a lesson learned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be a scary lesson learned. I mean, mm-hmm. anything anything inanimate that takes on a life of its own is a little bit creepy, yeah. And especially with doll babies. And it's funny because when you're talking about that, about naming a doll baby and it – the it realized that it was in like a human form. I'm thinking about mm-hmm. the very famous Robert the doll who um, is very scary and, and lives in Florida now, but he, they, they supposedly put him together um, and dressed him up and, and maybe, you know, the spirit that they put in it, um, he, it, it, that doll has a life of its own. I don't know if you never know, ever heard about Robert the doll, but yeah, I, I think I watched a documentary uh, with like Ozzy Osbourne, I think he had it. Was it better like <laughs> yeah. a replica of it? Yeah, yeah, he did. He he had a replica, I think. Um, 
because he can't. I don't think anybody can touch it. It's behind glass, and it's really scary. Oh, okay. But um, okay, so like Annabelle. Okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, let me see. Um, in the chat room, somebody said, "Doesn't seem like it'd be possible to basically steal part of someone's soul, let alone trap it in something." You have a response for that? Well, in in Appalachian folk magic, spirit and soul is a little bit. Uh, there's like an unspoken uh, difference between the two. Uh, the soul is, you know, what is, you know, called back to, um, you know, like the afterlife after somebody dies. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas your spirit is more so like your essence or your energy, basically. We just use different terminology. Mm -hmm. um, but you, your spirit or your essence is, it, it basically identifies who you are and it's still still yet a part of you. Um, just like a lock of hair isn't your whole head, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wonder, I've never thought of stealing someone's soul. I've, you know, we know about nail clippings and hair and all that, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure you'd go, how to go it's about. It's kind of like, um, how would I explain it? Okay, so uh, it basically goes on the on the premise that everything is connected, and to items or objects or people that come in contact, stay in contact for either forever or for a long period of time. Um, so it's like when you're catching somebody's spirit, you're basically catching a thread that's hanging off of them, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And as long as that thread is, uh, you know, caught up in a jar or in a in a doll baby or anything like that, then uh, you can basically affect the, that person's movements or path or, you know, what exactly happens to them, mm -hmm. whether for bad or for good. Okay, that makes sense. Um, that reminds me of Harry Potter and, and Voldemort having pieces of himself all over in different things, like in rings and, and whatever. So, yeah, it's kind of the same way. Um, but she said, well, what is a soul if not energy? Can he capture energy? But you're talking about capturing something tangible that has the energy in it, kind of, right? Yeah, basically. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to put it together in my yeah. head. Yeah. So then it says, well, if you're making this doll, putting some part of their spirit in it without their permission, well, yeah, horcruxes. Thank you, Kat. That was the word I was looking for, Harry Potter's horcruxes. But yeah, I mean... I guess, you know, when you're making a doll baby, when you're making voodoo doll, when we make poppets, um, we do things without their permission, you know, because we're doing it for a specific reason. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it gets complicated. It depends on the morality of, you know, who's doing what or whatever, I think. Um, but, you know, it goes on. and <laughs> We try not to do bad, but some people um, do. You know, I mean, it, it's just one of those things. It's how we how we're raised and what we need to do. And and you know, they say that you know, there's white magic and black magic. I think there, it's just all magic, and it just mm -hmm. depends on your intention of what you're going to use it for. And there are dangerous exactly. people out there that don't do it right. You know, they think they can and they do, and that's never a good thing. All right, so you've got chapters on. Folk recipes. You've got chapters on remedies. Um, another one on tools and supplies. You talk about spelling and fortune telling, um, living signs and omens and spirits. And the really neat thing about the book is that it's an easy read. It's interesting. Um, there, you know, there there are family stories and stuff in there and, and personal things that make it really an interesting book to read. Um, and while I was reading the book, um, it kind of felt like it was a labor of love. Not, I mean, yeah, you do some headbanging, too, when we write a book, for sure. But I yeah. really think it came from your heart, didn't it? It did. So well... Especially the, during... I'm sorry? And, and it, it carried into the second book, but especially what? Go ahead. Uh, especially because, uh, you know, not only was... Uh, it is essentially a, a a piece of me in my childhood, um, but also because it was written, you know, during a trial, uh, trying time in my family, because that was when, uh, I believe that was when my grandmother had her 
first or second big stroke. So mm-hmm. I was dealing with all of that while, you know, writing the book as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and she had already been, you know, dealing with uh, dementia for a couple of years by then. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it kind of means a lot um, to, when you feel that feeling to write it and know that, you know, you're carrying on their traditions and they will be remembered through your book. And I, I think that's really important. And you just mentioned, um, you know, and we've mentioned it a couple of times, the other book. Um, so everybody that is listening and, and really are enjoying what you're hearing today, Jake is coming back um, with his latest book, which looks like um, it might be released in a week or so. Tell me what you told them before. And it's called Doctoring the Devil. So Yeah, it's called Doctoring the Devil, uh, Notebooks of an Appalachian Conjure Man. Uh, it's, being, it's being released. Uh, the official release date is April first, um, but it's already being shipped out to people from like Am- from you know Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Mhm. And you know, um, I think, I think, I think, I think. Now that you've been talking about the playing cards and stuff, um, maybe at some point, would you mind maybe doing some readings for the chat room um, with those cards to show how they actually work and explain? Uh, yeah, uh, when exactly? No, we'll figure it out. But I mean, okay. you know, would it be possible to do that? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that when you know we get around to um, getting you into uh, the next book and, and talking about that notebooks again of an Appalachian conjure man. What does that entail? What kind of notes? What kind of things are in there? Uh, so it basically, it basically just dives deeper uh, into the things that uh, is covered in Backwoods Witchcraft, uh, but with a little bit more information. So like the first part of the book, um, let me get it here. So yeah, the first part of the book basically explains uh, the concept of witchcraft and conjure and how uh, witchcraft was considered taboo in terminology but not necessarily, well, in terminolo- terminology and ideal, but not necessarily in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of folks would, uh, you know, label an outsider as a witch and everybody would avoid him or her. They were basically excommunicated, uh, you know, from from the, the town or the community. Mm-hmm. Whereas those same people would, uh, you know, hire up another person, uh, whether he was a witch doctor, a conjure, a conjure man, or what they turned back then a witch finder. Mm-hmm. Um, to basically, you know, find out, you know, who was the witch that put this curse on me, um, have it, you know, sent back to her, anything like that. Yeah. Um, and even though they did the same exact works, uh, you know, between the witch and the witch doctor, um, whether that was, you know, doing love spells, healing people, laying curses, whatever, mm-hmm. uh, it, the difference laid mostly in the community's opinion. So, like, they would believe of the witch that her power came from the devil, she made some kind of pact, she signed a book, you know, anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas with the, you know, the faith healer or the conjure man or the witch doctor, that his power came from God, and he spoke to angels instead of demons. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I go further into explaining the concepts of, uh, you know, uh, basically making an, an effect in the world uh, through sympathetic magic, because that's basically the entire basis of Appalachian folk magic is sympathy, mm-hmm. like affects like. Yeah. Um, and then I also uh, introduced the reader to uh, historical figures who actually did this work, like uh, Marshall Benton Taylor, who was who's locally known as the Red Fox of the Mountain. He was, um, I forget what you would call it back then. It was basically before... Uh, unionized, you know, police forces or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he spent most of his career, uh, you know, running around the mountain searching for people who were uh, distilling and selling illicit uh, uh, moonshine or liquor. Yeah. Um, and they I've... called him the Red Fox of the Mountains because, uh, you know, he would go out looking for fugitives, but he didn't want the fugitives to know that where he was going. So yeah. he would cut off the soles of his shoes and basically turn them backwards so it looked like he was walking in the opposite direction no matter where he went. Uh-huh. Um, but he was also I'm, a faith healer and a preacher. 
Mm. I've got to cut you off because we've got to go, but we will okay. we will talk about all that. And really quick, where's your website? Where can people go find you? And your uh, they can follow me on Instagram at uh, Jake underscore Richards one three, I think, and then on Facebook, uh, my Facebook page, Jake Richards hyphen author. Okay, great. Um, we will see you back here soon. Thank you so much, and thank everybody for joining me tonight as well. And as well, always, everybody, um, blessed be, and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited.